This is an in the field and hands on review of the newly released Sony 200 to 600 millimeter super telephoto zoom. Hello folks. Yes, that's a little bit of a change. In the intro there, I was out in the field, here I'm at my desk. I went up to Northern Maine to photograph all kinds of wildlife um, and other things to put that 200 uh, to 600 millimeter lens through its paces. Um, and while I was out there, I recorded you know, a, a decent um, length impressions on my lens after using it um, for a whole day out in the field. But as I was editing that, I realized that I really wanted to share more with you guys. I wanted to go out again and uh, capture some more images to share with you. Um, so I did, I've done that now. I've gone out and photographed some loons on one of my favorite lakes around here. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to go in a couple of seconds back to my in-field recording that I did where I recorded my impressions of the lens. Then we're going to come back here to the desk. I'm going to share with you guys um, some more images, uh, and I'm also going to share with you guys some of my impressions um, that I didn't cover on that in the field uh, review that I did. Um, and as well, I wanted to share with you guys some of the bench testing that I did comparing the 200 to 600 with the 100 to 400 with and without the teleconverter. So we're going to go back to me out in the field, but stick around because when I'm done with that, we're going to come back here to the desk and I cover a lot more. See you in a bit. Hi folks, I'm Juan Pons and I'm here in northern Maine with beautiful Mount Catan right behind me. And I've been here putting my new Sony 200 to 600 through its paces in real world scenarios. Um, when I test a lens, I want to take it out where I'm expecting it to perform not in my house or in my backyard chasing my dog around or chasing a cat around the house. I'm going to go out and put this lens through its paces out in the field. How does it feel? How does it perform? What are the ergonomics? Can I carry it? What about the tripod? How am I going to mount it to the tripod? How is it all going to work together? That's what's most important to me. And I have to say I've also done some um, bench testing as well. I did some, uh, I shot some uh, resolution charts to actually compare this lens with what I hope will, it will be replacing, the Sony 100 to 400. And you asked me, why do you want to replace 100 to 400? Well, I love the 100 to 400. It's actually an amazing lens, the best 100 to 400 millimeter lens out there without question. Now, um, oftentimes I find myself using that lens with a teleconverter um, at um, you know that lens on without a teleconverter five six at uh, 400 millimeter it's a f5 six once you put that teleconverter we're talking about f8 um, and what that f8 does and the effect that that f8 does is actually not all that great when I'm using that lens for example with the a7r3 the a7R3 is not able to track subjects with the teleconverter on when I'm at f8. There's not enough light. What happens when you press that uh, focus button or that shutter button halfway, the camera focuses, but it, it's not able to track that running bison or a running coyote. It's just not able to do it. So what I was hoping was, but, oh, by the way, with the a9, that is not a problem. The a9 is able to focus with that uh, teleconverter on no problem at all. Yeah, it's a little bit affected because it's you know has less light to work with, but it can still track your subjects no problem. Um, what I was hoping was that with this um, new lens, that uh, I was able to be able to shoot this at 600 millimeters without a teleconverter, um, and my camera, even my A7R3, would be able to track my subjects. Um, I know my A9 can do that. This is the A9 that I have mounted on right now. But I'm not always shooting with the A9. Sometimes I like to shoot with the um, A7R3 because of the re added resolution that camera gives me in the expanded dynamic range 
the A7R 3 has much better dynamic range than the A9. And the, um, the A7R 4 you know, I'm hoping we'll have even more dynamic range and expanded files. That autofocus system is better than the A7R 3 but not as good as the A9. But I know that if the A7R 3 is able to track at, with this lens extended at f6.3, then for sure the A7R 4, I have to think about when I saw these numbers, um, will definitely be able to autofocus. So now, that bench testing that I did at home, what I did is I shot these resolution charts to really compare um, the uh, uh, the sharpness of these lenses one to the other. I shot with and without the teleconverter. So let's talk first about shooting both lenses at 400 millimeters without teleconverters. Now, my testing, I was trying to be as rigorous as I could be about my testing. You know, I measured the um, sensor plane of the camera to my subject to make sure that in both scenarios with both lenses my sensor plane was exactly in the same spot the same distance away from my um, test chart uh, i was controlling the light um, you know i had the, the camera on a tripod i had the the self timer um, to try to reduce vibrations all that kind of stuff and one thing that i did was i um, did manual focus i did not want to introduce any issues with back focus or front focus. I wanted both cameras to be as focused as possible. Um, so I did, you know, um, manual focus with the magnified focusing and peaking to make sure I was as accurate and as sharp as it could possibly be. Okay, with all the disclaimers out of the way. Well, well, actually, one more disclaimer. I'm comparing my 100 to 400 with the two, my 200 to 600. Um, Sony has been accused of having quite a bit of variation lens between lenses. You know, I haven't seen that, but there's certainly people that know more than I, uh, like Roger Sicala at um, uh, Lens Rentals, sees this quite often with Sony. He talks about variation in quality between one lens and the other. Um, so you may see something different. I can only tell you with the equipment that I have what I have found. Okay. I promise that was the last disclaimer. So what I found is that this lens, the 200 to 600, at 400 millimeters, when I compare it with the 100 to 400, at 400 millimeters, the 200 to 600 is a sharper lens. Yes, not something I was expecting. Honestly, I wasn't expecting that at all, but pleasantly surprised. Now I tested this both at f5.6 at f and uh, f6.3 on the 100-400 to match this one, and didn't make a difference. This one still was sharper. Now it's not a humongous difference. We're talking about you know pixel peeping here, you know looking in nice and close. Um, it's a very small difference, but there is a difference. This one is a little sharper and it's a little brighter as well when I'm shooting with the teleconverter, because this is 6.3 versus f8 when I'm shooting with a 100-400 in a teleconverter. That's two-thirds of a stop more light coming in. You know, not a huge amount, but you know, I'll take it. You know, more light is more light for sure. Now, when I tested this at 600 millimeters, um, compared to the 560 that I'm getting with 100-400, again, this lens was sharper. The 200-600 to 600 beat the 100-400 with a teleconverter. I wasn't sure who was going to come on top. Because the other one, the other lens, the 100 400 is a G Master. This is just a G lens. The other one's supposed to be better, sharper. Why not? Guess what? 200 600 beat them, beat it in both cases. I'm very pleased with that. Now, I'm, you know, bench test is one thing, but I like to get out in the field and use the lens the way I would normally use it. So that's really important to me. I am going to also look at the images that I'm getting out of it and you know, my subjects. You know, I'm here, like I said, in northern Maine. And I've been shooting moose, uh, red squirrels, birds, insects, plants, all sorts of subjects. Exactly what I would do when I'm out in the, you know, in a regular situation because that, that's what I want to test. Um, and I've been very pleased with the lens. The lens handles extremely well. <clears throat> um, I'm able to use it both on a tripod and a monopod and handheld. So that's three, not twice, not no, both. Um, 
you know, the lens is incredibly well balanced. You know, I I, I uh, attribute that to the fact that it's, you know, it doesn't extend as you zoom in or out. It stays the same length. It's all internal zooming and focusing. So the lens is really well balanced when you're hand holding and also when you're using on a monopod really, really nicely. I was very, very happy um, with the results. Um, so there are a couple of things that, um, you know, didn't measure up. Uh, I hate to say it, but um, although I love the lens and I'm for me, it's a keeper. I'm going to use it. I'm going to I like it a lot. I think it's going to be uh, an improvement over the 100 to 400. Um, there's a couple of things that uh, just didn't measure up for me and they're not huge but <clears throat> they are um, you know they're annoyances I'm gonna start with the worst one my biggest pet peeve or the biggest annoyance with this lens and that's the fact that the focusing ring and the zoom ring are reversed from the 100 to 400 um, I've been used to using the 100 to 400 um, with the uh, focus ring forward and the zoom ring in the back this one is reversed and this one also has the the accessory buttons between the two rings what that means is that the buttons are in front of the focus ring versus the 100 to 400 where the buttons were behind the focus ring um, and I like him having I like having those buttons behind the focus ring because what it allows me to do is press a button with my thumb and then focus with my fingers, my other four fingers. On this lens, I kind of have to do the reverse. I gotta press the button with my index finger and I gotta tweak the the zoom the, the focus with my thumb. Not a huge deal, but something to get used to. And if I'm gonna be shooting with both lenses, that's going to be a pain because I'm gonna forget and I'm gonna miss some shots or whatnot. So it may take me a little while to get there. Yeah, by the way, yes, there's a number of uh, insects out here. I've been bitten all day by horse flies, moose flies, deer flies, black flies and mosquitoes, um, plus other gnats and whatnot. So, so um, every so often I, there's one flying around me and I'm trying to kill it as I, as I touch my head. Anyways, um, so that's my biggest pet peeve. A couple other pet peeves. You know, the, the hood, uh, one of the things I really liked about the hood on the 100 to 400 was that locking button that it had. So that when you put that lens hood on, you know it clicked and it was in there. It wasn't gonna come out until you press that button. This one doesn't have that button. It's just friction, it stays there. So it feels like it's going to fall out. Um, it hasn't, but it doesn't feel as secure as it does with the 100 to 400. However, I will tell you that this hood does not have that little window um, that the 100-400 has. That little window that I, I hate. I do not like that little window because I keep opening it. Um, and by the way, for those of you that don't know what the little window is for, the whole idea behind the little window was really to um, uh, allow you to put a, uh, a polarizer and be able to turn it with the hood on. Um, so that's another thing I don't particularly like about, uh, about this lens. You know, this lens has all the myriad of buttons on the left side. It has a focus limiter. It has um, a uh, autofocus on and off. It, does, it has three autofocus modes that you can switch between them. Typical stuff. The last thing I'm going to talk about <clears throat> is really the foot. The foot is different um, than it is on the 100 to 400. So it's something to keep in mind. It's bigger. You, they're not interchangeable. Um, I like to replace mine with uh, foots from Really Right Stuff that have a dedicated Arca Swiss plate on them. Um, and I've already ordered one, so you guys can go ahead and order them. They're a little back order, but they should be coming in any day now. Um, I said that was the last thing, but I'm going to talk about one last thing. Um, how does the lens hold out in the field? How does it carry? I love the way the lens carries. It works really well. Um, haven't had any complaints. I can hand hold it. Um, it's not overly heavy. I can handhold shooting for extended periods of time without any any really um, effects. Much lighter than a 500 millimeter lens for sure. Um, so I don't know what else to tell you guys, but I really love the lens. I think this is a keeper. I'm going to be using this lens, I suspect, a lot as a wildlife photographer. I'm always looking for more focal length, and this gives it to me over the 100 to 400. Okay, I hope you guys were able to absorb a lot of the information. I, I provided a lot of stuff in there, 
but I also wanted to share with you guys some real world images when I was out in the field. Um, I'm gonna start with some of the images that I shot in Miller, Maine. Um, I will tell you my, ex my expedition out there uh, wasn't all that successful. And you know, this is wildlife photography. You know, sometimes you can go out and get completely skunked and sometimes you get very lucky. I didn't get completely skunked, but it was really challenging. Um, my favorite place that I go for moose, that I typically see a bunch of moose, I'm able to photograph moose uh, pretty readily. I only saw one moose that I was able to photograph. And he was a little bit skittish, you know, he didn't stick around for very long. But let's take a look at some of those images. <clears throat> okay, so this is the first image I wanted to share with you guys. And this is that moose that I told you about that I saw first thing in the morning when I was out there. Really nice bull moose. Um, he was out in the water, waiting in the water, eating, and you know, kind of far away. So I had to cut in through the woods. Uh, and as careful as I was to be as quiet as possible and cautious as possible, you know, that moose saw me a mile away. And as I emerged from the woods, he was kind of a little bit skittish. And you can see that in this image. He didn't run away immediately, he hung out. Um, but uh, did not, was not, was not able to make a lot of images. But you can see with a 200 to 600 here, um, I am, let's take a look at some of my settings here. I'm gonna get away, do away with some of this um, uh, accoutrements on the, on the display. You can see here that I'm using my 200 to 600, you can see that on the upper left hand side of the screen, at 524 millimeters. It's still quite dark, I'm shooting at ISO 6400. Um, but light, nice rendition of colors, of detail in an image. I can zoom in here quite a bit and wait for Lightroom to reload that image. And that you can see that even at 600, uh, 6400 ISO, we still have a lot of nice detail here in the, um, in the hairs, on the ears, on the uh, back. You can see the individual hairs on this moose very nice and clearly. You can see a lot of the velvet on on the moose um, uh, antlers. So um, nice rendition, nice color, nice detail on this image. I'm, I'm pretty happy with what I'm seeing on this image. Here's another image, that same moose um, that was kind of sitting there looking at me, kind of wondering whether I was gonna go away or was gonna stick around. Again, we can zoom in here, get a little bit of detail on the waddle here. You can see all this nice um, detail on the hair, you can see nice detail on the grasses. Again, ISO 6400, because it was pretty, pretty dark out there. Um, this is really early in the morning. <clears throat> I was also able to photograph um, a couple other smaller uh, subjects out there. This is a red squirrel that I actually followed him for, I don't know, for about half an hour. Again, super, super um, low light. I was in, in under the forest. It was like completely, completely dark. And you can see I'm, I'm shooting here with a monopod. Um, ISO 6400, and this is a 60th of a second at, IS, uh, at um, 600 millimeters. But I can still see a, a lot of nice detail here. I do see that I have a tiny bit of motion blur. Again, I'm shooting at 60th of a second at 600 millimeters on a monopod, but still there's quite a bit of movement. Plus these guys are really, really hyper. So they don't stand still for very long. But I do like the nice bokeh of this lens. Really nice creamy out of, out of focus areas in the background. Um, not at all like I see with other lenses that seem to be kind of more mechanical. This seems very organic and very soft. I'm really liking that, and I'm shooting at wide open at f6.3. <clears throat> Here's another one of that same red squirrel that I chased around a little bit. It was gathering some nesting material um, on this birch bark, on this birch tree. It was collecting some of the bark, and again, let's zoom in here. Nice detail on the image. Um, again, 6400, maybe a little bit more light here. I'm at 80th of a second. Um, 565 millimeters, but still very, very pleased with the image results. You can see um, some you know, areas here where I would expect to see maybe some um, 
So in chromatic aberration, not seeing much of that at all. Um, even in other you know, situations where I had really, really strong contrast, I'm not seeing any of that. Very nice, very nice uh, rendition of colors and uh, detail in the image. Here's another one of a black and white warbler. This is again very dark, but not as dark as it was before. Backlit though, which is, um, uh, you know, kind of more problematic and difficult um, to photograph. I actually have to boost this image quite a bit in, uh, in Lightroom. Uh, this one I'm shooting at ISO 1600, so a little better image quality of about 500th of a second. And let's zoom in on the eye here of this warbler. And you can see lots of very nice, rich detail in this image. And I'm zooming in, by the way, one to one. This image was cropped um, in, its, uh, in, its, in, in this size, it's, it's cropped. But this is a one to one rendition. You can see a lot of very nice detail. You can see the whiskers around the beak. You can see the individual feathers on the head of the bird. Nice um, eye ring. Lots of great detail. Really, really pleased with the resolution of this lens. Again, I'm at 594 millimeters, almost completely zoomed out. Look at the rich texture on this fern. Absolutely beautiful. ISO, I'm a little bit doing a little better here. ISO 800 f8 at 1 500th of a second. Again, I'm shooting with a monopod, so I am. Um, having you know, a little better time uh, stabilizing my tripod and uh, trying to get some of these really sharp images. And you can see, you know, I don't, I'm not sure how this is coming across on, on, the, on the YouTube recording, but you can see all these little hairs, fine, fine little hairs on the edges of the ferns. So lots of great resolution here. Again, nice and contrasty. You have these little hairs that are being lit by the sunlight with a really dark background and you know hardly any chromatic aberration. Beautiful, beautiful rendition. Really happy with that as well. Here's another one. Uh, this says high ISO. We're talking about 5000. Really again nice blurring in the background, nice bokeh. You can see really nice detail on these bunch berries. They have tiny little hairs on them and you can see those in there very nice and clearly, even though we're shooting at ISO 5000. Um, again, this is actually, interestingly enough, all the images that you have seen so far were shot with the A7R3. Uh, um, the images later on I'm going to show you, the loons were shot with the A9, but this day I basically shot most of the day with the A7R3. Lots of nice detail. You can see even some of the spider webs are here. Those are, being, those are rendering very nicely with this lens. So I'm telling you, I'm having a really good time with this lens. Very happy with it. Very happy with the resolution. So um, actually, this was, I shot this today, this morning, went out. I tried to go yesterday, but we had rain and overcast day, so that didn't work out. Today I had a much better uh, uh, weather conditions. The sun was out. I was able to go out there early in the morning, so I had low light that was a little softer. Um, and I went, I was visited by five different loons. Um, they were all together in a group. This is a time when they're starting to bunch together to getting ready, to get ready to head south. Um, some do go actually not necessarily south. Some may actually go out to the coast or to the, to the ocean near the coastline, but a lot of them end up going south. Um, again, beautiful resolution, uh, beautiful rendition, nice detail in the feathers. We can zoom in one to one here on the head of this loon. Um, and beautiful detail, absolutely beautiful. And you can see all this little, all the little uh, white dots on the face come in nice and beautiful. The eye comes out nice and sharp. Lots of detail and rendition. You know, these feathers on the head of the loons are so um, even that, you know, sometimes it's hard to even see the individual feathers because they, they mesh in so nice and tight to keep the bird um, dry. But you can still see a lot of that, the edges of those feathers. Very, very nice. <clears throat> Let's take a look at another one here. This is a loon stretching out its wings. You can see the splash of water 
all the little droplets up in the air. You can see detail on the head, nice detail on the, um, uh, on the little um, specks of white that is on the feathers. That's not water. They do have these little modeling, if you will. ISO 800 at the thousandths of a second to try to freeze some of this water. You can see some of these little uh, bits of water are streaked. So even a thousand, even the wingtip you can see here, I have a little bit of motion blur. In order to really freeze that, I need to be at about two thousandths of a second uh, on my shutter speed. Look at the resolution here. Look at the detail, all this feather. Absolutely gorgeous. Again, this is the A9 now that we're looking at. Um, and at 600 of a second, I'm on a boat and I'm handheld shooting this. So, um, you know, a small boat, it's only a 14 foot power boat, um, but um, absolutely gorgeous. Look at that background. So smooth, um, beautiful bokeh rendition on this lens. I'm very, very happy. Here's another pair of loons with one of them stretching out. Here is another loon. This image is cropped in. We're going to zoom in some. And again, you can see a lot of detail, beautiful detail. Now, let me tell you, some of these images, I've done a little bit of editing. Some of them have no editing at all. Um, and I'll look at them both the same way because that's, I mean, that's what I really care about. After I edit an image, you know, I'm going to, if I, when I print an image or I share an image, there's some editing going on. So my end result is going to be an edited image. So I'm going to be looking at um, images here you know, edit it as well to see what, you know, how the editing um, may affect, you know, the, the quality of the image depending on the lens to the camera combination that I have. So some of them I edit, this one's a little bit edited, there's a, a light editing. I do very light editing on all of my images. But look at that, very nice rendition of that water, the background. I love how the background is rendered with this lens. Um, I would have expected being a f6.3 that I would have less fall off than I have. Um, but it's absolutely beautiful the way it's rendering um, that background. Here's the same loon a couple seconds later. Let's zoom in here on the beak a little bit. We can see this water droplet coming down. Very nice rendition. These super, super sharp. Um, that eye pops out completely sharp. You can see the individual feathers on the head, which like I said earlier, with loons can be quite difficult. Here's another one. Again, super, super sharp. Beautiful rendition of the colors and the autofocus areas. And here is my last loon image. Now, let me talk a little bit about autofocus with this lens, um, because I know that for a lot of people that's super important. For me, it's very, very important. Um, I'm actually pretty pleased with autofocus performance. I will tell you right off the bat, autofocus performance on this lens lags a little bit behind the 100 to 400. The 100 to 400 feels like it, it is able to focus a bit quicker than the 200 to 600, especially with the A7R3. With the A9, the difference is negligible. You know, I can't really notice because the autofocus of the A9 is so remarkable. But with the A7R3, I feel that it does focus a little slower. Um, it focuses probably just as well as it does when I have a teleconverter on, on the 100 to 400. But when I have just a 100 to 400 on, um, that does, uh, without a teleconverter, that does feel like it focuses a little bit faster than, a, than the 200 to 600. Not overly so, you know, not uh, in a way that will you know, prevent me from using the lens. Absolutely not. I will be using this lens. Trust me. I absolutely love it. I love the form factor. I love the rendition. I love the sharpness of it. Um, but just thought that you'd want to know that it doesn't perform, it performs a smidgen slower than the 100 to 400. Now, talking about um, sharpness, you know, one of the things that you heard me say in the in-the-field review is how um, this lens, um, the 200 to 600, in my tests was sharper than the 400, the 100 400, even at 400 millimeters without a teleconverter on the 100 400. When I set my 200 to 600 at 400, and then I put the 
100 to 400 on my camera, and I shot test chart in controlled conditions, my um, my 200 to 600 outperform my 100 to 400. My 100 to 400 is pretty new. Um, I replaced mine, so this my, the one that I have now is probably like three months old, um, and it's actually seen pretty light use, so it hasn't gotten um, bumped or there's nothing wrong with it, and it feels just as sharp as my previous one. I've been very happy with it. But when I do this test, I will tell you, um, I was blown away by the fact that the 200 to 600 um, outperforms the 100 to 400. And let me show you here the charts. So on the left, we have, um, oh, by the way, let me tell you a little bit about how I performed this. My camera was locked down on a tripod. I measured the, um, the sensor plane to my subject to make sure my camera was exactly in the same location. Sensor plane was in the same location, same distance from my subject. Um, my um, uh, settings were all manual, including focus. I focused manually, um, zooming in on the with the with the focus assist to make sure that nothing like the um, uh, I did, wasn't having any issues like front focus or back focus. So. Having said that, what we're going to do is we're going to zoom in on this. Again, we're going to have the 200, 600 on the left and the 100 to 400 on the right. <clears throat> and I'm going to um, synchronize these images here because they are a little bit off. Just to make sure that we're looking kind of apples to apples as much as possible. Now that I've synchronized, I'm going to lock them so I can move around. And you can see, yeah, my 200 to 600, I had it at 397 millimeter. So I wasn't able to get it right at 400. Um, but you can see when I'm looking at these lines over here or looking at any of these lines for the numbers on my 200 to 600, you can see how this is a bit sharper. Now, it's not huge, trust me. Um, it's just slightly sharper and more contrasty than, um, than on the 100 to 400. And I did repeated tests of this to make sure that I wasn't, um, th there were no variables in there causing this, to make sure that um, I didn't see in one case one lens being sharper than in the other. In every single test that I did, the 200 to 600 came in sharper. Now, one thing that you'll notice is both of these are f5, uh, 6.3, and I wanted to match them at f6.3. I also did the test with the 100 to 400 at f5.6, and the results were the same. Um, I will be honest with you, I did not expect this. I did not expect the 200 to 600 to outperform the 100 to 400. Pretty surprising, but I'm very, very pleased. Now, let's take a look at the, the same test, but looking at um, the 100 to 400, and I'm trying to align these again so that we're looking kind of at the same images here. Um, so now they're aligned. Um, now, this was for me the biggest test. How well the, to the, 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 six, the 200 to 600 was going to compare with the 100 to 400 with the, um, with the teleconverter, 1.4 teleconverter. Yes, the 600 millimeters can be a little longer um, because you end up with 560 millimeters with when you put the teleconverter in the 100-400. You end up with a little brighter lens because you're shooting f6.3 versus on the 100-400 with the teleconverter, you're going to be at f8. Um, but even then, looking at these, the 200 to 600 again beats the 100 to 400 with the teleconverter. Um, you know, a lot of people say, well, that's kind of expected with that teleconverter. And sure, you could say that. Um, I've always been very happy with the 100 to 400 and a teleconverter. I thought it always performed incredibly well. I never hesitated to use that. But now looking at the 200 to 600, you know, I'm not sure why I would ever shoot with the 100 to 400 and the, and the uh, teleconverter. Um, the difference is um, better. It's, it's actually, there, there's a bigger difference now between the 100 to 400 and the, um, and the, 600, the 200 to 600. 
The 200, 600 is even sharper than the 100, 400 with the teleconverter. So um, I hope that this uh, helps you out in as you evaluate this lens and uh, you decide whether you want to purchase it or not. Um, again, if you have any questions or there's something I didn't cover, you know, make sure to uh, send, write up a comment on YouTube or send me a message on Facebook. Well, I'll send you back out in the field and let me out in the field say goodbye to you. If there's something I didn't cover or you had any other questions, make sure to send me a message on Facebook or um, add it to the comment section on this video. I check these and I answer them as much as I can. So make sure to add those if you have any questions. Until next time, take care, folks.